<clears throat> okay, we are now live. You can start. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to session three for BPMDS um, uh, series. Today, we are looking at three great presentations in the area of event stream and predictive monitoring. So to start off with, we have a slight change in terms of the order. So we are going to be starting with the second uh, presentation first. So the topic of the presentation is intercase properties and process variant considerations in time prediction, a conceptual framework. And uh, the presentation will be given by Professor Nina Sofer. Welcome, Nina and please um, share your screen. Okay, thank you. Um, just a sec. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm Nina and I'm, uh, I'm speaking about uh, intercase properties and process oriented considerations in time prediction conceptual framework, as Maud just said. And this is the uh, work of uh, Avichai Greenwald, uh, who could not present, and uh, myself and Osi Mokri. So we're talking about prediction in process mining. Many people talk about it uh, these days. It's a hot topic, and there are many approaches and algorithms uh, which intend to predict uh, some variable for a running process case based on its uh, properties and on a predictive model which is trained over uh, past cases uh, in an event loop. Um, and uh, well, most of the approaches, or at least uh, in earlier, uh, focus on uh, uh, the intrinsic uh, case properties, uh, like its uh, data attributes and its uh, uh, partial trace and history, and use it for predicting its future. In our case, we're talking about time to completion. And recently, um, also uh, some approaches that use intercase properties were proposed. Uh, and this look at uh, the um, properties of or properties derived from a cases that run in parallel to this case. Uh, however, although different and many proposals were made, uh, there are still uh, many open questions and no agreed upon understanding. For example, which properties should be considered? And which cases are relevant as a basis for these intercase properties? And so to put things into order, as in uh, yesterday's uh, keynote, uh, our aim is to propose a conceptual framework that would guide analysts in de uh, designing and engineering intercase properties for time prediction. So um, I'll talk a bit about our premises of why intercase pro properties matter. Uh, so first of all, cases that run in parallel to a base case, the case which we try to predict, are part of its environment, and environment matters. And in particular, we see two kinds of relationships among cases. Uh, first of all, there are direct dependencies, which can be due to shared resources, and also to shared data attributes, which cause data impacts among uh, cases. Second, we expect correlation among cases, specifically cases that should be similar, but when they run in parallel, they get um, also effects from the environment. Uh, these uh, environmental effects are typically not recorded in the log. We don't know about them, but they do affect all the cases. Like, for example, pandemic uh, is not in the log, but it does affect all the cases that run in parallel. Okay? So these are the basic ideas that um, lie at the bottom of our um, uh, conceptual framework. And before I introduce it, I need to uh, briefly introduce two key concepts, uh, which are peer cases and process variants. And even before that, I will, uh, I will uh, talk about an example scenario, which is actually uh, the main log uh, we use in this study. And this is a container terminal at the harbor. So as you can see, at any given moment in this environment, there are many, many containers which are being handled. The process is a container handling process. And uh, each container is a case of this process. And we're trying to focus on one specific 
uh, case, let's call it CONI, okay? And uh, we're trying to predict the completion time of CONI based on the properties of CONI itself, but also on the um, other cases, other container in its environment, which are the peer cases. So, peer cases. Uh, if this is the timeline, yeah, and this is the current time, and this is the trace of our CONI. We are here at this moment, at this event, and we're trying to uh, predict the completion time of CONI. Now, we cannot tell anything about the future, but we know the past. So we can take a time window starting at this moment and going backwards. Whatever cases are within this time window, like this one, which ended here, and this one, which started here, are the peer cases, and they form the basis uh, for uh, calculating the intercase inter properties. So these are the peer cases. <clears throat> and now let's talk about process variants, or do all cases matter for the prediction? So going back to our environment, the uh, harbor container terminal, we may be able to notice that not all containers are uh, the same. We have export containers and we have import containers. See, these are marked here. And of course they don't go, they don't take exactly the same uh, process. So these are two process variants. There is the import process variant and the export process variant. And if CONI is an export container, should import containers be considered uh, for the intercase properties or the prediction? So our uh, claim is that intercase properties can be variant aware or variant indifferent. Both possibilities exist. Um, the variant aware intercase properties are the ones that consider only the same variant as CONI. Okay, and they reflect correlation among the cases uh, that should behave similarly. So for a variant aware intercase properties, we only consider export containers in the case of CONI. Uh, but there are also variant indifferent uh, intercase properties, and these properties consider the entire environment. The environment can be extremely loaded or uh, with a low load, and, and this may affect uh, and for, for this kind of properties, uh, we cannot ignore uh, the import containers. We need to um, rely on all the containers. So um, variant in different intercase properties are properties that are calculated considering all peer cases, no matter what variant. So now we have these two um, concepts and we can go to the conceptual framework, which is actually what I showed in the first slide, but here I go into this black box of intercase properties and look at them uh, from the four known um, process perspectives of control flow and resource and time and data. And you may also notice that we have this VA and VI mark for each one of them, and these stand for variant awareness or variant indifference of the properties. But I have to convince you about this. So uh, I will discuss each one of these perspectives. I will uh, give one example properties for, for each perspective. Many, many properties can be engineered, but I will only show one, perspective, one uh, example property and try to convince you about uh, the variant awareness or indifference. So starting with the control flow perspective, uh, which relates to the sequencing of activities and path selection and looping behavior. So this kind of um, behavior or, or information is expected to show correlation among cases that should behave the, uh, similarly, namely cases of the same variant. And hence we consider these uh, properties to be variant aware. So here's an example property for this uh, perspective. We can count the number of occurrences of each activity uh, in the traces of the peer cases. So each peer case has its uh, partial trace and uh, with activities and we can count how many times each activity is uh, executed. And then we have actually a, a set of features, a feature for each uh, activity. And with this, we can say that if other export containers are repeating these activities, so may CONI. 
okay? But we consider only the export uh, containers for this matter, and this is a variant aware perspective. Next one is the temporal perspective, which relates to the timeline of cases. And here again, we expect correlation among cases of the same variant. We consider this as a variant aware perspective. Um, an example property would be the average deviation of the elapsed time of each activity of the peer cases from its expected elapsed time. And for this, we need an expected elapsed time for each activity, which can be calculated as a pre-processing step uh, over the entire log. And with this property, we can say that if other export containers are delayed, so may Coney be. Imports are not considered here. Okay, now moving to the resource perspective, it relates to the load on resources and it directly reflects the state of the environment. The entire environment um, resources can be shared among variants and hence we consider this to be a variant indifferent uh, perspective. An example property can be counting the activities uh, for each resource or resource group or role uh, for the peer cases. And then we can say that uh, all resources are extremely busy, so Coney will have to wait. Now last, we get to the data perspective, uh, which relates to specific known values of specific data attributes. And this unfortunately is um, extremely uh, domain specific, highly domain specific. And so I cannot say anything in general about whether these properties are variant aware or variant indifferent, it should be considered um, for, uh, per situation. So I can give you a specific example for our scenario. We can uh, count the number of containers whose cargo is hazardous chemicals and say that if many containers carry hazardous chemicals, uh, they need special handling and Coney will have to wait. Okay. Um, so, uh, but, but, but this is very specific. So actually this is the framework. Okay, uh, it's quite simple, but uh, it should assist analysts in engineering intercase properties and reasoning about whether they should be uh, variant aware or variant indifferent. Uh, and we wanted to test this uh, framework. And so we implemented it uh, as an extension of an existing uh, prompt plugin and we added functionality uh, which uh, um, enables uh, uh, executing these uh, ideas. And we conducted a set of experiments uh, with uh, several aims. First, we wanted to test the effect of each perspective on the time prediction. Uh, of course, each perspective uh, separately and all of them together. So we used a baseline of intrinsic case uh, property, pr uh, prediction based on intrinsic uh, case properties and added uh, properties of each uh, uh, perspective separately and also uh, in combination and tested uh, the effect on the prediction accuracy in terms of a uh, mean absolute error. Uh, next, we wanted to test uh, our assumptions concerning the variant awareness or indifference of the properties, whether these uh, are validated by uh, real uh, data. And we also wanted to gain some insights uh, from successful and unsuccessful applications of the model. We used several data sets for the experiment. Uh, our main data set was the container terminal, which is marked as TOS, Terminal Operating System. Uh, we also used the BPI Challenge 2012, which deals with loan applications over the internet. We used two of the uh, BPI 2015 uh, uh, challenge log. Uh, this is a building permit uh, process in uh, Dutch municipalities or something like that. And we used the road traffic fine management uh, log uh, using only the cases that ended successfully in payment. So um, first set of uh, experiments. Uh, which, as I said, tried to assess uh, the contribution of each of the perspectives separately. Uh, we look here at uh, three uh, results of three data sets. This is the uh, container data set, um, the export variant here. So let's look at this one. We started with the baseline, intrinsic property baseline of 50 hours mean absolute error. Adding each perspective improved 
separately improve the prediction uh, quite significantly. And uh, the uh, highest improvement was uh, achieved by the data perspective. But when we combined all of them together, we got the best results. Uh, and this is a 34% improvement of the mean uh, absolute error. And this is quite a nice uh, result. And then the two uh, logs uh, of the BPI challenge 2015. So again, we can see that each a perspective separately here. Uh, the control flow perspective made the greatest uh, improvement and all together, all of them together, uh, give the best result, 29% improvement. Also for the other log we tested, uh, similar with 24% uh, improvement. So these are really nice results uh, and uh, they definitely validate uh, our uh, a framework, but we got some additional results uh, for additional data sets. So here are results obtained for the container data set, but the import uh, variant, and here we only got 6% reduction in the mean absolute error. It is a reduction, but only 6%. For the loan application over the internet, hardly any improvement at all. And also for the road traffic fine management, only 1.5%. Uh, so you may say this is highly unpredictable. I say there are reasons for these differences and we need to ask why. But I will not go into it now. I will leave you with this question and <laughs> I will get back to it soon. Uh, now I will uh, present the results of uh, the other set of experiments intended to test uh, our assumptions concerning the variant awareness and indifference of the properties. So what we did here is to uh, take each perspective and try it in both configurations, uh, variant aware and variant indifferent, and see which one gave the best results. And these are the results for the export uh, data set of the containers, the export uh, variant. And uh, so we can see that for the resource perspective, indeed, as a, a in line with what I discussed, the better results uh, are obtained for the variant indifferent uh, perspective, uh, configuration. And for the control flow and time perspectives, again, in line with what uh, we anticipated, uh, better results are obtained for the variant aware configuration. Uh, for the data perspective, we did not have any uh, expectations, but it was invariant indifferent. And similar results were obtained for the uh, import uh, variant, but we wanted to test other logs, so we took the BPI challenge 2015. And uh, we didn't have the domain knowledge to uh, establish the variant in this case, so we had to um, look at the, the reports and read and, and we, we found some data which seemed data attributes that seemed uh, to make sense and we tried this with this log but we got some surprising results because uh, for all perspectives in both logs almost uh, the variant in different configuration gave uh, the, be the better results and by far okay really uh, yeah by far uh, uh, the difference. Uh, so our explanation is that perhaps this was not the right variant. And perhaps there's no real variant in that log. So our uh, conclusion is that if you don't know the variant, variant indifference would give better results because it uses more uh, information. So I will now come to the concluding observations. Uh, and what we saw is that different properties can be more beneficial to add in different data sets. Uh, sometimes it is the data perspective, sometimes it is the control flow. But in all cases, in all experiments, the combination of all perspectives uh, gave the best result. Okay? Now I go back to, to this uh, a highly different effect for different data sets, this unpredictability I uh, was discussing. Uh, this definitely needs additional research, but we have some uh, guesses, we have some directions, uh, possible explanations. 
One is uh, batch due dates, which exist for export containers. So they all need to be on the ship at the same time when it embarks. And this makes the intercase uh, properties extremely informative. In contrast, uh, there are uh, processes where completion time depends on an external party, okay? Even for the uh, import uh, containers, uh, they have to wait for the customer to come and pick them. And for the road for traffic fine management, the offender has to pay the fine. So uh, this has very little to do with the peer cases. So they are not very informative in this uh, situation. And of course, there's also the issue of shared versus unshared physical environment. For the containers, we have a shared physical environment, high dependencies, and for the loan applications over the internet and for the um, uh, road traffic fine management, uh, there's no uh, shared physical environment. So these are possible explanations, but definitely, definitely, it is uh, very interesting to do additional research and establish this. Um, last point is about the variant identification. If we don't really know the variant, then uh, the variant in different configuration would be safer and would yield better results. So eventually, future research. Um, main issue, main interesting question is how to predict when interface properties will improve prediction, as uh, I just discussed. And uh, we may also want to extend this framework to additional prediction tasks, such as next activity and uh, process outcomes. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you, Nina. All right, so we have about eight minutes for questions. So I'll, uh, as a participant, you are able to raise your hand or use the chat function or use the Q&A function. So we'll be monitoring all three options. So yes, do we have any questions for Nina? Okay, I see uh, a hand raised, so let me you. I'm trying to look for this. <laughs> All right. Okay, Marco, would you like to? I'll unmute you so if so that you can ask the question yourself. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, definitely. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much for the presentation. I think the work is very interesting. And uh, as you have said, it's worth investigating more. I have uh, a question and a remark. The question is, uh, what would be the actual practical application of the framework? In the sense that uh, if the objective is only to improve a performance, then I have the impression, even from the results that you showed that, that in the end, we could just try everything and just pick the model that works better. You know? uh, so I wonder whether, you know, you have thought about, you know, how do we use this uh, uh, classification framework that you uh, proposed? And the remark is whether, uh, because I have the feeling that when doing a research on predictive process monitoring, we need uh, more event logs for which we know the context. Because a lot of times with all these logs that we use the, the, the road traffic and, um, and the BPIC, I mean, we, 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 we have the data, but we don't know much about what happened in uh, the process. So when we, when, you, when we look for uh, explanations and interpretation of the results that we get, I have the impression that often, you know, we are guessing, you know, we have, a, we have a feeling for it, but we are not really sure because we basically only have the data. Okay, thanks. So uh, good question and good comment. <laughs> uh, so let's we'll start with the question. Um, 
Well, we did implement some um, interface properties uh, in this extension of the from plugin, but that's not the main issue. The issue is that when you uh, take a data set and you want to do uh, to design um, a predictive model, uh, you start engineering properties, and this framework helps you think and reason about what properties to engineer because we read a lot of uh, you know, papers with uh, prediction approaches and intercase properties. And uh, there was always a focus on one or two properties uh, without uh, a broad look of what, can, what, what other pro uh, properties can be relevant. So we uh, provide this framework uh, to help you think. And uh, you may design, you may use our properties or you may design additional properties, but uh, you know that there are other perspectives as well, okay? And you can think whether this should be uh, variant aware or variant and different. You can also test it. Yeah, right. Now, concerning the domain knowledge, um, yeah, that's true. And yes, we have these data sets. But I have to say that uh, our choice of data sets was not uh, uh, random, okay? Uh, we did select the DPI Challenge 2012, expecting it not to have a significant effect because we, we thought that would be the case. And uh, again, and, and the road traffic fine management, again, we expected a small effect. Uh, and we, we even filtered uh, only the, the cases that end up in payments to, to clean up any uh, artificial uh, um, completion times, okay? So we had some expectations. We did not just select uh, by chance. We were surprised by the difference between the export and the import. Uh, we didn't expect that, and then we, we had to think why it is so. Um, and yes, I agree, we, we, uh, it is completely different to um, investigate a log where you uh, have access to domain or knowledge to, to more context than when you just take a, a log and, and pick it up. <laughs> thank you, Marco, and thank you, Nina, for the answer. Thank you. We have another question, this time from the chat um, from Marlon. Um, it's a long text, so let me see if I can summarize oh. <laughs> but maybe you can read it as well. So I'm let trying me, to. Anyway, uh, the workload of the workers in a process has a direct impact on delays. So if the workload is higher, delays are higher. Also, demand has a direct impact on workload and therefore on delays. The more work is generated per time unit, then the more there will be delays. These are real causal relations. There is a clear mechanism that links higher workload to more delays. Do you think your framework captures these causal relations? And if not, could it be extended in this direction? Oh, um, well, yeah, we don't, uh, I don't think we, we capture causal relations, but we can see the effect. I mean, when we look around and we look at the environment, we can see the difference between days where there is work, uh, high workload uh, and where there is a smaller workload. Now, the workload can be, um, uh, we, we, we can infer the workload for, from the um, creation of, of new cases, okay? So when more cases, so this could be another property um, that is considered uh, the uh, number of uh, uh, new cases created per uh, time unit, and then uh, it can be, uh, yeah, it, it can it can be uh, considered, but currently it's not. All right, thank you, Nina. So I think we are right on time. Uh, to move on to our next speaker. So um, I'd like to thank you, thank you for your very interesting presentation. I have a few questions about it myself, but I'll, I'll try. Yeah, I just, just, just one I see in the chat, one comment which is important. 
uh, and it's from uh, Ossi, who was a co-author here, saying that the perspective that gives more improvement is a good candidate for exploring causality, could be. And again, need to look into that. All right, thank you, Nina. Um, Thanks. Could I please ask you to- Yeah, stop, I stopped sharing. Sharing, thank you. So our next presenter uh, will be Tobias Herbert. Tobias, would you, are you able to share your screen, please? Yes, of course. All right, so Tobias- Can you see the slide? Yep, I can see it now. So Tobias will be presenting um, uh, his work on generating reliable process event streams and time series data based on neural networks. So all yours, Tobias. Thank you, Mo. Yeah, so my name is Tobias Herbert from University of Vienna and my co-authors are Stephanie Rinderlemar and Jürgen Mangler from Technical University of Munich. And so with our paper, what we want to achieve is take small data sets and boost them. So increase their size and um, increase them with uh, reliable data is what we call it. And we mean that it's uh, a size and a quality that is sufficient to use it in machine learning applications. So we want to increase the size of data sets. And so commonly in the production lifecycle, for example, the data set grows over time and we want to train machine learning models on this data. And the problem that we're facing is that for quite a long time, it's not possible to train a machine learning model that performs uh, adequately. Um, and so there's a given threshold. And then uh, from that one forward, it's possible to train a model. And then the quality, so the performance of the model increases over time. And so what we want is we want to set a fixed data set size uh, that we can use then in our uh, model. Um, and for that, we generate data. So we take our small, still small data set and we generate data to fill it to that size. And then over time, the generated data gets of higher quality because it has more training data available, uh, as well as there's more real data in the data set itself. And so uh, further on, I will go into then how it um, changes the model performance over time. And so the focus of the data here is time series data. So that can be sensor data from many different domains like manufacturing or medical, as well as climate data or also connected devices. And uh, stock data is also an interesting aspect. And for businesses can be sales or inventory data or also event history. So we are not limited to numerical data. It can also be text or unstructured data, as long as it is data over time. And so the domain that we also did our evaluation in is the manufacturing domain. And here we have a CNC machine uh, with a logging server that produces metal parts. And uh, many aspects of the machines uh, are monitored, for example, for the X, Y, Z axis and the spindle, uh, the motor load and torque. And um, the problem in manufacturing is always you want to have the machine running uh, smoothly without interruptions, uh, producing high quality parts. And for that, we have to make sure that there's no deterioration in the quality and there's no risk of uh, outages. And so for that, we want to train a machine learning model that can monitor the machine to see if there's any problems. And so in the life cycle, we produce more and more parts and the data is being logged. And that is the input, the time series for our model. And then it's deployed and monitors the machine continuously. The problem is that here, especially we are in a small batch production environment. So uh, the type of part is produced uh, changes quite often. So the data set never has the chance to get to a size that it, we can train a proper model. And so that is why we introduced GenLog, so the generation of log files. Uh, and in here, we use machine learning models to learn the distribution of the data and then generate more data that follows that distribution. So that's the boosting of the data set. And a quick introduction to neural networks. Um, so we have our input layer where we have our features. In this case, would be the different motor axes. And then we have one or more hidden layer and they're all connected. 
and then we have a, a output layer. So this in the monitoring model would be the classification of a, a part is being produced correctly or if there are any problems. And so this has a feed forward architecture and has trainable weights. So the connections have weights and uh, we train them through back propagation uh, because we know we have labeled data so we can see what it should be and what it is and then through back propagation uh, train our weights and our model uh, and use gradient descent to minimize that error and now we have many different variants of uh, neural networks uh, for example convolutional neural networks which are commonly used in uh, image classification and image segmentation for example, in autonomous vehicles to see where in the picture is a pedestrian or other cars, uh, as well as natural language processing, for example, in virtual assistants. And here uh, we use the convolution to uh, use filters to identify patterns in the data. Then there are recurrent neural networks and here the time domain is taken into consideration. So in machine translation, for example, it's very important the words that come before and after the current words, so the temporal context. Uh, and the same is true for music composition um, and time series anomaly detection. So those are some use cases. Um, there's also the um, variant of generative adversarial networks. And here we have two neural networks, uh, a generator and a discriminator. And the generator uh, is trying to generate new data and the discriminator tries to distinguish between real data and generated data. And they are jointly trained. And with them, it's possible to do image synthesis. So take input images and generate uh, similar images as well as transfer learning. So for example, uh, relatively famously StyleGAN uh, aspects of a person, so the age or appearance uh, can be changed. Uh, so there will be an example for transfer learning uh, and also 3D model generation from images. So those are some um, applications. And so we are focusing on recurrent neural networks since we are mostly using time series data. And here the neural network forms a directed graph along the temporal axis. And instead of just using the feed forward architecture, it uses uh, feedback connections as well to find the patterns uh, along the temporal axis. So what happened before and after. And it also includes an internal state, uh, which allows it to have the variable length uh, of the time series. So a convolutional neural network, for example, might expect uh, an image of a certain size, and it can only use this as an input. And here we are dealing with a variable sequence length. However, they do suffer from the vanishing gradient problem, uh, which means the error that is backpropagated uh, gets smaller and smaller uh, until it reaches almost zero. And that means uh, it's not really possible to take into consideration information from uh, a long time back, so thousands or ten thousands of time steps in the past. So that's especially difficult uh, to take into consideration seasonality, for example. And to um, deal with that, uh, one variant is the long short term memory. And here we can see an individual cell of an LSTM. And it uses the forget gate, input gate, and output gate to uh, control the flow of information. And here the error is uh, propagated directly to the individual cells. So it's not propagated through all the cells, but to directly to the cell. And with that, it's possible to um, have the information from uh, nodes that are like further in the past. And so we don't just want to uh, train a machine learning model uh, to generate data, we want to have a, a full pipeline. Um, and for that, uh, we take as an input uh, log files, and for example, XES or MXML, and we extract the time series data from it. And then we resample the data to then be able to use it for model generation. So then we train our recurrent neural network. And then we use the um, time series data and the model to generate new data and thus increasing the, the data set. And now we're still at time series data. So the last step would be to re embed or remap the data into the log file. And um, it's, I think it's also possible to uh, omit some of the steps. So, if, for example, we already have CSV files with the time series data, we can use them directly. Or if you want to uh, put an uh, additional interface to an existing process to use the data directly automatically, uh, we can uh, also do that. 
And so here we can see the interfaces between the different uh, pipeline steps. So we start with the log files, which can be YAML, XS, uh, MXML. And then we get uh, the time series data that we extract from it. And then we resample them, or in the case of uh, generative adversarial networks, we also bin them because they expect a, a set a size for the time series. Then we train our machine learning models uh, and then use the information from the second step, so data resampling and the model generation, the third step together to generate new data. So we use all the available time series data with all the trained models. So it's like a, a grid search approach so that we can increase the variance uh, to a maximum degree. And then in the end, we take that time series data and we um, remap it to the log files. And as we can see, the last step, so the output from the last step is the same as the input from the first step. And that means we can uh, go through the pipeline again. So we can take our generated logs and put them through the entire pipeline again. Uh, and with that can increase the data size even further. Of course, there's a caveat. So if we have a small data set with very low variance, this will not change. We cannot come up with uh, artificial variance. So it is dependent that the data set that we have includes a certain amount of variance. And to evaluate um, the quality of the, uh, the pipeline and the machine learning model, uh, we created an online tool that's also accessible under this URL. So I invite everyone after the presentation to uh, check that out. And we can see here the log files that we used uh, in the paper as examples, and uh, they can be downloaded to inspect them, and they can be selected to start a training run. Then it will go through all the individual pipeline steps. And then in the end, they can be downloaded to directly compare them to the original and um, they can be evaluated. And on the evaluation page in the beginning, we can see the different steps that were taken. And then we can also see directly uh, in blue the generated data and overlaid uh, the, in red the, the real data, um, so original data. And I will go into that a bit deeper. So these are two examples for the X and Y axes. Um, so these are the input data and we can see there's a bit of noise. Uh, and in the end, there's also quite a lot of randomness because at that point, it's not deterministic anymore. It depends on what the machine is. So the, the person is, is doing. And if we look now at the generated data, these are based on six data samples. So these are six uh, generated data samples. And uh, we can see there's uh, quite a bit of variance in different places, but the uh, original data set uh, did not have a lot of variance. So this is uh, exactly what we would expect. So it follows the distribution uh, with slight um, variances. And of course, in the end with the randomness, um, also in the generated data, this can be found. And um, that's too far. We use for evaluation uh, correlation coefficients. So for example, Pearson, Spearman, and Kendall. So either direct linear correlation or based on the rank. And here uh, we are expecting high correlation. So we want to be close to one um, and like, yeah, in a range from roughly 0.8 to, to one. So we want to be highly correlated, uh, but we want to um, obtain the, the variance that was in the data. Um, however, this only gives us like a single number and it doesn't tell us where the, the deviation was in the, um, in the generated data. And that's why we use dynamic time warping. And here we can see, so we have in the y-axis the original data and on the x-axis the generated data. And here we can see over time where the changes happen. So a diagonal would mean they are identical. So the generated data would be identical to the original. And so these are our deviations. And with the minimum path distance, we can also see that one of them, one of the six, is quite a bit smaller than the others. And that is because this is the sample that this specific model was trained on. So the the time series that this model was trained on was used with the model to make a prediction. And the reason why this is not close to zero is because the model is not overfitted. If the model was overfitted, we would expect a value close to zero. Uh, and that would tell us that um, we have to adjust our hyperparameters. 
Um, and if our minimum path distance was significantly higher, that would tell us that we just did not learn enough uh, about the data yet. So this can be a good uh, metric to evaluate the results as well. And here we can see how our evaluation metrics uh, correlate to each other. So we would expect that uh, the correlation coefficients to each other all correlate uh, very highly. Um, what is interesting is to look at the Euclidean distance and the dynamic time warping. So Euclidean distance is just uh, simply computing the Euclidean distance between the two time series, so the original and the generated. And um, the dynamic time warping can take into consideration if there's gaps in the data, or in our case, it's common to have speed overrides at the machines. So the machinists can say the machine should work a bit faster or slower, and then the time series would drift apart. And so Euclidean distance would fall apart here. And so then we can, with that uh, value here, we can see that there were either quite a lot of uh, speed overrides or um, gaps in the data. So that can also be a good indication uh, of the data set. And here we can see uh, again the correlations between the metrics, um, but now for all the individual parts. So here, those are the six individual parts that were produced. And um, here we can see that for this part, um, the dynamic time warping um, deviates quite heavily from, for example, the correlation coefficients. So this is worth investigating to see um, if this is a sam data sample that should be discarded, or actually maybe it's a very interesting data sample because it might have a failure in it. And we might actually want to boost exactly this type of data to create a more balanced data set. And so this can also be something quite interesting in, for example, the medical field where um, maybe the majority of data is from healthy patients and uh, the minority is from uh, sick patients. So this is also helpful to identify those specific data samples. And so coming back to our original depiction here, um, the model performance with the generated data um, in the beginning uh, is usually not reliable and it depends heavily on the degree of variance that we have in our small data set. So this is why we also specifically focus on how much variance uh, exists in the data, because uh, if we have a small data set with low variance, um, it will not be reliable because it will not um, be a good representation of the variance that exists in the data. And then um, over time, it uh, smooths out. So it has a linear increase in quality. Um, and so it, it will always be the combination of uh, the indication of how reliable is the data set at this time um, compared with uh, the performance. And so uh, what we also want to do uh, with the future applications is to use an LSTM directly and compare it to our current monitoring model. So instead of classification, we want to use um, the LSTM to stream our data directly in near real time to the model. And the model will predict what it thinks it should happen based on what it was trained on. And uh, this can be compared to what is happening. And then an alert can be triggered to the machinist. Uh, and we want to compare that to the quality of the, the performance of the current monitoring model. And um, the LSTM can also be used to fill in the gaps of the data logging because the machine um, prioritizes machining over data generation. So then if it's, uh, if it's in heavy use, then there's log uh, um, data logging has gaps in it. And so we can use the trained data uh, to fill those gaps as well. And we want to focus also more on the using generative adversarial networks for data generation. Um, and so far, we have noticed that the resources required to train uh, are significantly higher. So orders of magnitude uh, longer training times. Um, so it's quite powerful for very complex data, um, but it's not very feasible in a very dynamic near real time environment. So, but that's also why uh, the pipeline is created in that way that um, different machine learning techniques can be used and different data um, as a research tool, as well as being easy to embed it into existing processes. So yeah, I invite everyone to use the tool uh, later on um, and to play around with it a bit. And with that, I conclude the presentation and uh, look forward to questions from the audience. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tobias.
So again, like before, so you are welcome to either raise your hand or put the question in the chat or in the Q&A function that you can see in this uh, Zoom presentation. So, yeah. Do we have any questions from the audience? Is yeah. Can you can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So uh, thanks for your talk, uh, Tobias. It was uh, very inspiring, and I, uh, as a result, I have uh, some questions. Uh, so my my uh, question would be about motivation part. So uh, I can start the question with uh, uh, as follows. So, uh, have you ever applied uh, your generated log to any prediction uh, task to uh, to mm -hmm. pro, uh, to facilitate training or promote the performance of the prediction model? Yeah. That so we have big, used. Uh, so we have used the, um, the generated data um, in this context. So for the, the part that was shown um, uh, in this process. And um, here is the case that the vast majority of parts are okay and uh, very rarely there's an anomaly. So like that something breaks. So um, we had a very low variance in the data. And um, so that was reflected there. And then so uh, we focused here on increasing the anomalies. So we focused on the parts when something went wrong to increase them. And that helped the model significantly because before it was just, it had uh, really just a handful of um, runs that were failing uh, and it just uh, couldn't, it was not a balanced enough data set. So it helped a lot to balance the data set. And mm -hmm. for that, the performance increased a lot, yeah. Yeah, so actually the low variance in uh, in the model, I mean, the model to generate the, uh, the low uh, was uh, my concern. So probably uh, it would related to the more philosophical question. So to promote the prediction task, uh, should we have uh, more data that resembles uh, the previous or original data or should we put some, uh, I don't know, filtered variation uh, to increase the variation level? So that was uh, yeah, actually uh, the, the follow-up uh, question. So do mm -hmm. you also have some other uh, objectives to train the model, not in a way that you can uh, exactly resemble the uh, original data set to mm -hmm. uh, make better application for later steps? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that really depends like on the domain. So in our use case, we don't want to uh, introduce, let's say somewhat random uh, variation. Um, because the machine um, has a, like very strong relationships uh, to each other because all the aspects are highly correlated the, within, the, within the machine. Um, so it would depend on the data set, but it's uh, certainly um, an interesting approach to say, for example, we use convolutions or uh, some other techniques to introduce also some artificial variants. Um, mm -hmm. If that is, um, that could be beneficial in some data sets for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. thanks a lot. So we'll look into it. Thank you for the question. You're welcome. Thank you both. So do we have any other questions from the audience? Oh, right. Then let me ask you a question. So, um, Tobias, you talked about you know the the introduction, of course, of additional data points so that we can apply machine learning um, algorithms, right? So that's the that's the basics of this the, the motivation of this work. Um, because you were also talking about process events and so on. So and talking about the event logs that people might have. So how do you see? How do you see the work or the data sets that you have generated? How do you see them being used in process mining? So that's, that's sort of like mm -hmm. the general question. The second question mm -hmm. is more, do you believe that, let's say, if you are adding perhaps more cases, right? And, and the process mining being supposed to be more based on real behavior, 
So how do you see this working with the data sets? That way, let's say half generated from the approach and half are, you know, quote unquote, real. So I'd like to hear your views about the applicability of these data sets for process mining. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thank you for the question. Um, so on the first question, um, it, it really depends. So um, it is uh, it is really like the question of um, the data set um, and uh, how it will be used. So like um, it's it's depending on, for example, if it's like in the medical domain, it's really sensitive. So here there, it's really important to take into consideration the evaluation uh, metrics to see uh, how reliable it is. Uh, at that stage, um, uh, if we consider the generated data in it. Um, and if it's more on the kind of anomaly detection side, um, then it can be, it's relatively easy to use. So like it, then it doesn't require as much uh, human intervention. Um, so that was the first question, uh, the second question. The first question, could you ask again, sorry. <laughs> So uh, I think that was like the first question because I was asking how does it work with it. This, my, my second question is if a data set contains both the real data, the real behavior data, mm -hmm. and the simulated data, um, how would it work, right? How does it, how does it work for the process mining from the perspective that now we are not looking at the, the completely real data, which is what process mining uh, yeah. counting on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So uh, an LSTM, for example, a recurrent neural network can also be used on all the other aspects that are not time series data. So this would be required because if we say we have like now the generated data, which uh, is not the same, uh, can differ quite a bit, uh, and we re-embed it into the original log file, then it's also uh, important to take into consideration how the other aspects in the log file should change, like how they relate to each other. And so this depends really on the application. So in our case, it was sufficient to uh, work with the time series data because we want to monitor the machine. Uh, but if you want to go further and we want to say um, how other aspects of the process, when the process changes, for example, how it affects the production, then this is important to take into consideration. And then here, um, it is quite helpful to use then generative adversarial networks because they their performance on these more complex uh, inputs uh, tends to be better. So then we are using both. We're using an LSTM uh, within a generative adversarial network to generate both the time series data uh, as well as the other um, aspects of the log file. Yeah. So this will be a big part of the future research. Okay, uh, so thank you, Tobias. So we have um, a question in the chat. So um, mm -hmm. from Ferris Leno. Well, I am sure I'm butchering your name, so my apologies. So, um, the, so the, the comment and the question. So like first, thank you for the presentation. Very interesting. I have a question about the potential applications of this method. Do you think that there could be a situation where it's not reliable to use this method. I'm thinking about an environment where there is more human intervention, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So it, it depends like how predictable the data is. So if the data set um, has a wide variance, so there's a lot of this different aspects in the data, um, then you need a certain size of data and you need to guarantee that that variance exists. So um, then it's important to do pre-processing and pre-analysis to see if uh, important aspects of the data are in existence. Um, otherwise, it will create a, a very imbalanced data set. So um, there are certainly domains and applications where this is the case and um, this has to be considered. And that's why it's important to really look at the input data set, um, what variance is there, and use domain experts to, to judge that as well. Uh, because it's not necessarily easy to do that um, like automatically. Uh, it might be relevant to have a domain expert at that step as well before the training. Okay. So thank you for the question. Okay, thank you both. All right, so we are right on time. Uh, 
call for the next presenter. So Meg Tumas, may I please ask you to unshare your screen and then I'll invite Gunan to share his screen. All right, so our last and final uh, presenter for this section is Gunam Park, and his uh, topic is on towards reliable business process simulation, a framework to integrate ERP systems. Gunam, the floor is yours. Yeah, well, thanks for your kind introduction. So my name is Gunam Park. Uh, so today I'm gonna talk about towards reliable business process simulation, uh, a framework to uh, integrate ERP systems. So I think Tobias' work was a great introduction to my work. So uh, if Tobias was automating uh, the event stream generation, I'm uh, here doing with the domain experts uh, by ensuring the quality of the uh, data. So let's see how it works. So this work was uh, is co-authored by uh, Will, uh, Professor Will van der Alt, and uh, I'm excited to uh, virtually visit uh, Melbourne. Uh, Okay, let me uh, yeah start. So uh, so let me first briefly introduce a digital twin of organization and uh, business process simulation. So in reality, employees uh, in the organization uh, will communicate or interact with ERP systems to perform business activities. So uh, digital twin of organization uh, is a digital representation of uh, the business process. Uh, in uh, in such organization, so by replic uh, sorry simulating uh, such mirrored representation, we can uh, analyze operational frictions uh, in in the organization and uh, and uh, business process. And moreover, we can uh, support decision making based on uh, evidence. And what is the relationship to business process simulation? So uh, business simula process simulation is key enabling technique uh, of digital twins. So it basically replicates uh, the, the human behaviors or process behaviors in the organization in a simplified manner. Uh, and it enables uh, data-based analysis, based analysis or uh, decision-making uh, processes by simulating it. So for example, by using uh, what if analysis. So how we can implement digital twin with uh, business process simulation. So this is a simplified uh, workflow. So first process analysts need to understand, uh, sorry, uh, just, uh, I just wanna use a laser pointer so that I can guide you better. So uh, first process analysts need to understand how uh, employees in the organization interact with ERP system. And based on such understanding, uh, he or she uh, can design and implement a uh, simulation model with, uh, with the help of various uh, simulation tools available out there. And then uh, by simulating the model, we can analyze uh, the simulated behaviors in the, uh, in the business process. So as the name suggests, uh, digital twin, uh, uh, should reflect the reality because it's a uh, replication of the reality. And to do that, uh, it is essential to uh, incorporate business logic and data restrictions of ERP systems. Uh, so current existing uh, simulation techniques focus on providing, uh, let's say, easy to use simulation tools with uh, high flexibility in uh, the design and implementation phase. Uh, however, uh, uh, it is almost infeasible to uh, incorporate such uh, restriction and logic inside a single business process simulation model. So for example, in a simple uh, SAP ERP system, you can uh, find more than 2000 restrictions, which is of course infeasible uh, to, to incorporate in, uh, in simulation model. So, uh, so in this work, we uh, try to incorporate ERP systems directly into the process simulation, uh, let's say workflow. So, uh, so now the process analysts need to understand only that the human behaviors in the organization and then build a simulation model 
and then such simulated behaviors will be automatically uh, applied to ERP systems uh, as if they are from real uh, employees in the organization. So by doing that, uh, we have several benefits. First, we don't need to model the complex design of system into simulation models, which uh, makes uh, analysts life a lot easier. And then more importantly, since we are using uh, the ERP system as it is, we, don't, uh, we are guaranteed to have uh, simulation results which are uh, error free. And, uh, and third point would be that, uh, so there are a bunch of techniques uh, developed or implemented in an organization to analyze the uh, ERP system or uh, any type of information system that they have. Uh, now, since we are using the ERP system uh, as it is, we can have the same view uh, to the simulated behavior as we see uh, the real life uh, behaviors. So I hope that motivates you to follow my talk uh, enough and uh, I will uh, get into more detail. So yeah, before getting into detail, I first need to introduce how ERP system works. So that should be the preliminary. So ERP system consists of uh, three different layers. So first layer is called presentation layer, uh, where human resources interact with the systems to create order, to uh, patch a delivery, or collect a payment, uh, whatever. And uh, the, uh, the human inputs, which are commands, uh, are translated into system readable uh, formats, which are called executions uh, in the application layer. And then, uh, the, the execution of such executable format will update uh, the database of the system in the database layer. So I will give you a quick example. So for example, Jack is creating an order uh, for three iPads and then such command. So it is important to remember uh, all those uh, terminologies uh, highlighted because I'm going to use it uh, quite often in the later slides. So uh, such command, will be translated into system uh, readable format, which is execution. So for example, creating order activity will be mapped into transaction uh, code uh, T101 in this case, and all other uh, relevant information or uh, parameters will be uh, transformed into system readable format. And uh, the execution of such uh, executable format will update, for example, order table, item table, or uh, stock table in the database layer. So based on the understanding uh, on ERP systems, uh, now the question is how we can incorporate ERP systems into uh, business process simulation. So here, uh, uh, okay, so let me first talk about, uh, start with the presentation layer. So. Basically, we replicate human behaviors, uh, how human resources are interacting with the presentation layer uh, into a simulation engine. So by uh, building a simulation engine, we are, uh, we are uh, replicating the human behaviors, which are commands. So commands uh, uh, represent the human behaviors in the organization. And the such commands will be transformed into executable format uh, by transformation engine, and then such executable format will be directly uh, applied to application layer. And uh, all the executions will update the database, and then we can extract the simulated event data in, uh, in the same manner we extract real life event data, and then we can analyze the simulated behavior. So it's uh, quite a lot to follow. So I, I made a quick example uh, to, to help you, uh, your understanding. So uh, first, so process analysts need to design a simulation engine uh, which uh, simulates human behaviors in the organization and then it will generate commands. So in this case, it will be a command about creating order by resource check and about item iPad. So uh, such commands, uh, which, is, which are human behaviors uh, will be transformed into executable format by transformation engine. Importantly, uh, with the help of uh, two uh, map mapping functions. So for example, this command will uh, be, uh, uh, this activity will be transformed into a transaction called T101 according to 
transaction mapping here, and then all relevant uh, parameters will uh, be transformed into system readable parameters. For example, resource should be mapped into ID information, and then item information should be uh, MAT. Uh, uh, yeah, it's just random. Uh, yeah, it, it, it depends on example. So such executable formats will be uh, automated inside ERP systems uh, as if they are uh, really from uh, Jack. So uh, that was about example. So uh, now I'm going to explain how we've implemented the proposed framework. So for ERP systems, we use uh, SAP ERP system that supports a uh, fake company called uh, Global Bike Incorporation. And then for a simulation engine, we use uh, CPN tools as a simulation tool. Uh, so CPN tools is based on a uh, color petri net. Uh, so you can design color petri net and then add some simulation, uh, let's say components to, uh, to, to uh, implement simulation models. And for transformation engine, we implemented a prompt plugin. Uh, called uh, ERP simulator. So uh, if you visit uh, this uh, GitHub repository, you can find all the details of implementation and also uh, user manuals. Yeah, of course, source code would be there. And uh, this plugin has two major purposes. First, uh, it translates commands into executable formats. And second, it triggers such executable formats inside uh, SAP system. So uh, in the following slides, I'm going to uh, explain the simulation engine and transformation engine more in uh, detail. So first, uh, simulation engine. So it's quite hard to explain the input side first because it's uh, quite uh, uh, yeah, human dependent. So we assume there is a, a analyst who can design a CPN tool. So I, will, I'd I would like to first focus on the output part. So output is uh, the commands which encode the human behaviors. Uh, so the, the, uh, such file is stored as a command uh, XML based uh, CMD format, uh, which looks like this. And uh, so since we have simulation model, is, it is obvious that uh, we can have such human behaviors. Now the question is uh, the input side, how we can design such uh, uh, simulation models uh, uh, replicating the, the human uh, resources in the organization. So uh, to, to facilitate such process, we provide a schematic uh, template of CPN models, which incorporate all the essential components of business process simulation. So based on uh, such template, uh, the, let's say experts can design the simulation model and then can generate the commands in a CMD format. So next about uh, transformation engine, uh, it's quite uh, more intu intuitive. So here the input uh, would be commands and then transaction mapping and then uh, parameter mapping. And given such inputs, it produces uh, SAP executable uh, formats. And in this work for ex SAP executable format, we use uh, SAP RFC, which uh, stands for SAP uh, remote function calls, and each function call uh, includes all the relevant information to trigger transactions inside our SAP system. So it's not that intuitive this RFC function uh, uh, is. So uh, I'd like to give you uh, the presentation layer example. So this is uh, the, the execution format that we are going to apply directly into application layer, but uh, it looks like this in this uh, in the presentation layer of SAP system. So human resource would type in the order information and then customer information and uh, item information. So this will be transformed into uh, these kinds of uh, executable formats. Uh, and in this case, in, in our work, we use uh, SAP RFC function. So uh, to evaluate the feasibility of uh, incorporating ERP systems in uh, process, business process simulation, uh, we'd like to, uh, so we answered uh, the following two questions. So first, do simulations comply with uh, business logic and data restrictions of ERP systems? And second question is, do simulated event data contain 
insightful knowledge as real life event data uh, do. So to answer such question, uh, we conducted a, a small case study using SAP order to cash process. And we uh, identified some common challenges that you can easily find out in uh, case studies of SAP order to cash process. And then in each scenario, we uh, simulate the, the human behavior and then try to answer uh, the previous two questions. So before getting into the, uh, the scenario part, I'd like to first introduce the order to cash process. So uh, basically order to cash process is all about creating order and then collecting payment. So it consists of four different phases. So the pre-sales activity phase, uh, in, in that phase, uh, the customer will make some inquiry about the paper to uh, ask for details. And the company will uh, answer such inquiry with quotation that contains all the details about items and uh, etc. And then uh, if the quotation is uh, success, sorry, uh, uh, satisfying the customer, uh, the order will be processed in the order processing phase. And then uh, such order, I mean, the items in the order will be uh, delivered to the customer in order fulfillment uh, phase. And finally, a uh, company can collect the payment in the billing phase. So the, uh, I think given the time, I would only have time, uh, uh, I would be uh, introducing only one uh, scenario, uh, which will be a low conversion rate. So low conversion rate uh, concerns these uh, relation between quotation and sales order. So conversion means uh, quotation is transformed into sales order, which is good for a company. And low conversion rate means uh, such conversions are uh, infrequently happen. So, uh, so this is uh, the upper part of this slide uh, explains how we uh, implemented uh, the scenario using the implementation that we introduced before. So first we need to design this uh, simulation engine. And then this simulation engine produces uh, 288 commands. And then such commands will be transformed into uh, SAP executable formats. And then such format uh, will be directly uh, automated uh, in SAP system, also by uh, this uh, plugin. So we uh, executed 288 uh, RFC calls and then uh, 288 uh, of them were successful, which uh, validates that our transaction is complete and error-free. So uh, as a result of uh, the execution, we created 286 objects uh, by updating 11 tables in SAP system. And then uh, figure A, B, C uh, explain uh, the insights that we can get uh, from the simulated behavior. So the figure A first explains uh, the process model uh, of uh, order to cash process. So as you can see here, uh, more than 80, sorry, 50% of uh, orders are not uh, transformed into uh, orders, which is uh, bad for a company. So to analyze uh, the behavior more, uh, we made an assumption that uh, such low conversion rate is because of uh, long response time uh, to to inquiries from uh, customers. So by response time, uh, we mean that uh, we mean the time between finishing or completing creating quotation and then uh, the time uh, that uh, where we, uh, when we uh, finish uh, making inquiries. So uh, as you can see in the figure C, there's a positive correlation between response time and then uh, unsuccessful unsuccessful uh, conversions. So that uh, already shows that uh, our scenario uh, or simulated behaviors contain uh, interesting, uh, let's say insights uh, in SAP system. So uh, I'd like to move on to the conclusion part. So uh, to summarize, we incorporate ERP systems in the course of business process simulation. And by doing that, we don't need to uh, model the complex design of uh, uh, ERP systems inside uh, simulation models. And moreover, we can have the same view, uh, view to the simulated uh, event data 
as the real life event data. And to evaluate uh, or to validate uh, the feasibility, we uh, conducted a, a, a case study in order to catch process of SAP uh, system. Uh, as future work, we plan to apply the framework to uh, action-oriented process mining techniques. So action-oriented process mining is about uh, evaluating the violation of constraints and automating the actions to uh, deal with such violation. So we can incorporate uh, our framework to uh, action-oriented process mining uh, in a way that we can uh, re-evaluate the efficiency of generated actions. So we can simulate the, um, uh, let's say, uh, generated management actions uh, to evaluate or to see if it really works. So uh, for, uh, uh, for another future work, we uh, plan to improve the framework by introducing some feedback loop uh, into uh, the current framework. Uh, so by feedback loop, we mean that uh, the simulate event data can give insights to improve the uh, sim simulation engine. Uh, uh, and, and we can update or improve the simulation engine uh, in a way that it can reflect the human behaviors in a better, uh, better way. So thanks for your uh, attention and uh, now I'm open to questions. All right, thank you, Gunnar. Let's see. All right, so we have a question in the chat. Um, so I'll try my best to pronounce the, uh, pronounce the name. I know who it is. I can't pronounce it. Um, Mahendra Wati. I'm so sorry if I'm butchering your name. Um, so the, the comment is, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Uh, perhaps I'm missing something. Why do you need to replicate human behavior when ERP has the standard business processes that you can use to create the simulation models? Is it to scope the research work? Yeah, uh, thanks for your question. So uh, uh, I would say uh, that it's because uh, we want to have a reliable simulation model. So uh, if we do not replicate the human behaviors in a, a business process, that actually means that we cannot replicate such behaviors in SAP system because SAP system is full of restrictions. So if we don't exactly, uh, let's say, model the behaviors, uh, we already uh, are very prone or vulnerable to uh, possible errors in uh, simulation mode, uh, simulation results. And having exact simulation result is, uh, is as you can imagine, is very uh, important. So that is the reason why uh, we uh, have human, uh, let's say process analysts in between uh, the, the organization and then uh, simulation engine. All right. Thank you, Kunal. Do we have any other questions from the audience? You can use either the raise hand option or in the chat or in the Q&A. Okay. I'm not seeing any more questions, so let me ask you a question. I have a couple of questions. Let me start with the uh, first one. So, um, so my first one, you know, in my experience, like whether or not you can rely on the simulation generated data depends on how good your simulation model is that you are you are setting up, right? So my my question is around how much effort do you have to put in? in designing your own simulation model in CPN. Clearly, we all know that it's not straightforward in CPN, but in general, how much effort would someone need to put in to create the simulation model so that they can get, you know, what you were saying, reliable uh, insights from, the, uh, from this analysis? Yeah, so uh, your experience uh, already says everything. Uh, so. I would say uh, the learning curve is quite steep. So, uh, so from the beginning, it took quite a long time to figure out uh, which behaviors uh, the, the real organization would have. 
and then also applying them uh, to uh, C uh, CPN models. So that was quite, uh, let's say, uh, time uh, consuming. But after having such a learning, uh, I mean, steep learning curve, it now it becomes more, um, uh, let's say, automated. So we are trying to build uh, some other business processes implemented based on uh, this framework. And uh, I cannot say exact time that we take for each uh, business process, but I can say that uh, we are uh, doing it much faster than uh, before. All right. I'm not seeing any other questions coming from. Okay, so I think there's another question. So it says, how generalizable is your work to other business processes? So I uh, would say for generalization of uh, uh, the proposed framework, uh, two things are important. So first, uh, of course, building simulation engine, that would be uh, one thing. And second one would be to understand uh, the business process that you uh, have. I mean, not the, the uh, concept of business process. Uh, what I meant is uh, understanding how business process is supported by uh, information system. Because in, in the framework, you need to interact a lot with uh, ERP systems, otherwise you cannot automate such behaviors. So uh, I would say uh, that uh, if you understand uh, how your information system supports your business processes, and then you have uh, bit of knowledge about a uh, simulation model, I think the framework itself is already very much generalized. So it's uh, all about implementation. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we have another question in the chat. Uh, so it's from Amin Jalali. Um, so is it possible, uh, will it be possible to generate CPN models based on constraints in the ERP systems to perform simulation? I'm thinking if this can be done, then the work is quite reusable with lower cost for simulation. Yeah, uh, thanks for your question, uh, Amin. Uh, uh, the answer is no. Uh, if it was possible, I wouldn't uh, uh, put my efforts to uh, have this uh, framework or I wouldn't try to incorporate the IP systems in a simulation uh, process. Uh, yeah, so. I would say it's it's uh, unreasonable that we think, uh, for example, SAP is a big company and then they uh, support more than, uh, I, I don't have exact number, but let's say uh, more than 100,000 companies. Uh, but there is no uh, such support for building simulation models. So there are a lot of constraints, but you actually need to understand uh, all the constraints to have uh, exactly or reliably working simulation models. So uh, it's, a, uh, it's a pity, but uh, I will say based on the, the framework that we propose, uh, you are already uh, in a position you can uh, simulate such ERP system much easier than uh, just using, uh, let's say, simulation tool. All right, thank you so much. Uh, do we have one last question? from the audience. Okay, I don't think so. I think I'm in mean, just saying thank you. All right, then, um, so then perfectly on time. So we are doing very well. Um, so in that case, I'd like to thank uh, Gunan for, for your presentation. And um, so that concludes this section for the BPMDS section three. Could you please join me in thanking all three presenters for their very interesting presentations? Yeah, thanks a lot, Mo, for organizing uh, this uh, nice session. So uh, I also learned a lot from sessions. So it was a uh, very productive time for me as well. And okay. hopefully for yeah. uh, our audiences as well. Yeah. And thank you everyone for joining us. We had about 50 uh, attendees for this uh, workshop. So it's a very good, very good number for that. Thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of your conference as well. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.